Joined now by Eric Schmidt, co-author of the book, The Age of AI. Eric, thank you for coming in this morning. You've really been at the forefront of this debate for quite a while right now. Break down both the promise and the peril of AI. Well, imagine a world where you have an AI doctor that makes everyone health healthier in the whole world. Imagine a world where you have an AI tutor that increases the educational capability of everyone in every language globally. These are remarkable. And these technologies, which are generally known as large language models, are clearly going to do this. But at the same time, they face extraordinary, or we face extraordinary new challenges from these things, whether it's the deep fakes that you've discussed, or what happens when people fall in love with their AI tutor? What happens when- We all when, saw that crazy New York Times article. Sorry. Yeah, in fact, I'm not too worried about the New York Times reporter who was married, having the AI system try to get him to leave his wife. That was just a, an error in the computer. But I'm much more worried about this use in biology or in cyber attacks or in that sort of thing, and especially in manipulating the way the body politic works, and in particular, how democracies and work. And this is happening far faster than most of us realize. ChatGPT hit 100 million users in two months. It took Gmail five years to do the same thing. The diffusion of this technology is so fast, I can't even keep up, and it's all I do. So talk, so talk about the impact on politics. Well, let's think about it. From birth, all of us are taught to believe what we hear and what we see. You can now generate things using computers that sound incredibly authentic. You saw that in the piece from Rebecca. Um, and you can also generate pictures that are as authentic as you could possibly see with your own eyes. And furthermore, technologies like the Midjourney one are open source. So if you put in a rule that the technology has to mark itself, it has to say, hey, I'm a fake, so the other computers know it's fake, how do you know that that facility has not been taken out of the software? So we collectively in our industry face a reckoning of how do we want to make sure that this stuff doesn't harm but just helps. But is there any way that the industry can actually come together to do something about that? Well, historically, there have been a couple of moments uh, after the nuclear age, after the uh, recombinant DNA age, uh, the scientists and the political leaders came together with appropriate restrictions. This is the time for the people in my industry, the government, economists, philosophers, to understand this. What happened with social media is we, including myself, just offered social media because we had a simple model of how humans would use social media. But instead, look at how social media was used to interfere in elections, to cause harm. People have died over social media. No one meant that as the goal, and yet it happened. How do we prevent that with this technology? And remember, another thing about these large language models is as they get larger, they have what is called emergent behavior. We don't know what they're going to do. If you and I are having a big argument, a big fight, I know you're human, I know you're, you have children and a family and a, and a mother and a father and all that. If I'm having an argument with the AI, I don't know its provenance. I don't know its theory of mind. I don't know how far it will go to win. So what should we do right now? The right, right now, first, the government's got to figure out how it wants to talk to us about this. Second, our industry's got to get an organization or a set of organizations to discuss how to put appropriate guardrails in place to keep these things in alignment. Everyone's focused on bias, which is certainly a problem, and is being worked on. But the real problem is that when these systems are used to manipulate people's day-to-day -day lives, literally the way they think, what they choose, and so forth, it affects how democracies work. What would a guardrail look like? Well, today, uh, again, OpenAI and ChatGPT use a technology called RLHF, where they actually used humans to actually box it. So they had this raw thing. Think of it as a child without any training. Right, and it's rough, and it's smart, and it's clever. And they, put, uh, they had humans essentially say, don't go here, don't go there. If you ask it a nasty question, it'll say no. Those systems, which are now, they're only six months old, are working. We need to make sure that they get built, and they get stuck, and they can't get out. One company I know of took a constitution and put it inside the training and said, you, Mr. Large Language Model, I'm sorry, anthropomorphizing <laughs> it, uh, the computer, um, you can't violate your own self-constitution, and it programmed it that way. So there's hope that we can come up with training mechanisms and algorithms that will prevent the worst uses of this. It's really hard, though, for us to wrap our head around the scale of this change, isn't it? Yeah, I've never seen, I've done this for 50 years, I've never seen something happen as fast as this. And it, partly it's because the technology is there, and partly because there's so much money and so many people, hundreds of thousands of people. Another way to think about it is you and I sit there and say, oh, okay, well, it's just three or four companies, we'll talk to them, and so forth. That's not how it works. There's an enormous number of people, and every country is involved with this. So even if the U.S. fixed it, 
How do we get the other 197 countries to get it right too? Eric Schmidt, thanks very much. Thank you.